Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to my cool vet's first annual Black History Observance Ceremony. We are new here in the Burlington County area. And one of the things that we strive to do here at Cool Vets, one of our mission statements is to bring people together and invest in the community. The word of our cool and Haitian Creole means courtyard. And after Haiti, we may First, one of their freedom and their independence. And they developed the Lakou court, uh, the courtyard system, the Lakou system, where they would support each other yeah. and come together and, and, and help each other grow and defend and protect themselves against the return of the plantation or the slavery system. And our goal here at Lakou is to bring this to you in that same concept here in South Jersey and bring everybody together. So we are proud to start with Black History Month. Uh, celebrating our heritage. We have a wonderful uh, program for you. you know, we have uh, with, uh, Paul Shaw, who's going to talk to us about the, the local fusion of uh, slave capture trade. We have Sam Steele, who's going to talk to us about the Steele family. We have a, a wonderful vocalist. We have the African drum and dance team. And uh, we're going to have a wonderful ceremony today. So we're going to start our ceremony off uh, with Lift Every Voice, sung by Kismet. Henderson, and then we'll have a presentation from New Jersey orator Bailey Brick, and then a presentation from the African Drum and Dance Ensemble. So please put your hands together and welcome this man Henderson. Victory is 
Thank <laughs> you. 
Good morning. My name is Louise Prescott, and I am a proud member of the Lily Club, Burlington chapter of the New Jersey Order. The piece that I will be reciting today is I Am Not Giving My Black Back by Ebony Blackman. Let me say, as I begin, I am proud of the skin that I am in. Be it caramel, mocha, chocolate, or black. To be small, medium, or large, tall, skinny, or fat. I am proud of my heritage, and I am not given my black back. Not to the white man, nor to the children, not to anyone in fact. I won't let anyone get me down, put me down, take away my self esteem, or push me around. I am not giving my thoughts back. How it inspired me to put the years up to God. I'm inspired by my birthright, by my heritage, above all our God. As I have said, when I begin, I am proud of the skin that I am in. I won't let prejudice or negativity hold me back. I am solid, strong, poised, focused, and proud. Always keeping self worth intact. I am not, I repeat, I am not giving my block back. There are many ways you can give it back. If you don't hold to your values, remain focused and intact. For example, rising high, persevering, you have become a star. Putting your past behind you, hiding who you truly are. To satisfy a mission on the road to stardom and fame, you gave up your box for a recyclable paper test with the stroke of a pen and hand as you are molded, bent, twisted, and spent to the way of how they want you to be. That's just another way in our modern day to willingly give in to slavery. It's one way to be focused. Yet things are not clear. It's another to willingly give up, but it's too precious and dear. The memory of your past values, family values, your parents are still. They are proud of where they came from. So why aren't you? Can you feel their pain? Can you see their tears? It is good to persevere. Just remember to keep your self worth and values intact. Don't let anyone cloud your mind or slow you down. Don't let anyone hold you back. Be honored and proud of who you are. And never, I do mean never, give your black back. I am proud of who I am and the color of our skin, the way we use our mind and to stand the test of time. Yes, I can proudly say yes. I am proud to be black. I will never trade my color or heritage. I am not giving my black back. Back to the people who enslaved us so many centuries ago. Back to the people who tried to be born, who would have let us build as a family and grow. No, I am not giving up. I'm not standing still. I am building a strong foundation in fact. Our memories, our wisdom, our ways, our heart and soul. This they can never take away. God has our inner essence in fact. Standing firm upon my belief, I am not. I am not given my black back. Thank you. Is everyone in the room ceremony so far? Yeah. Monday of St. Express. Thank you so much for the acting of Monday of That is such an amazing, amazing presentation. Now, thank you so much for coming out and trying to talk and this definitely not for the last time.
you know, here in Kathy. Uh, moving on with our ceremony, I would like to introduce Paul W. Schott. Paul W. Schott has been a student of local history for more than 45 years. Paul has the position of Assistant Director of South Jersey Culture and History Center at Stockton University. He is a well-known and respected authority in the New Jersey historic history community. While the breadth of his knowledge is quite wide, Paul has maintained a special affinity for Black history in Southern New Jersey and has made an area a specialized study for the past 30 plus years. He is here today to present two stories about future slaves living in present day Mount Laurel and West Hampton, respectively. He draws these accounts on a larger body of research on runaways living in the area of New York and Southern State. Without further ado, please help me introduce and welcome Paul Shaw. Good night. On a warm Thursday evening in September 1845, a group of strangers from Maryland, led by William Chase and riding in two wagons, pulled up. <laughs> what I say about technology is it's great when it works, but when it doesn't, it's a source of endless frustration. Yes. And I think you're going to have to advance on this. It's not working for me. All right, got gotcha. you. All right, let's just leave it there for a moment. So let's start over. On a warm Thursday evening in September 1845, a group of strangers from Maryland, led by William Chance and riding in two wagons, pulled up in front. Next slide. In front of the Green Tree Tavern in Eastern Township. They ordered meals for themselves and, next slide, feed for their horses. They indicated to Mr. Bodine, the tavern keeper, they would not retire the gates. Rather, they would spend the night at the table in the tavern as they intended to leave early in the morning. After some belabored entreaty, Bodine convinced the men to take a room. True to their word, the men had their horses harnessed and hooked their wagons and departed from the tavern. Next slide. About daybreak. The men drove out Green Tree Road to what we know today as Mount Laurel. When they turned left, went over the mount. Next slide. Passing the uh, Friends Meeting House on the right and the Friends School on the left. As the wagons approached the intersection of Morristown Mount Laurel Road and Union Mill Road, the men stopped in front of a small hamlet known as Petersburg. The settlement hardly even tried to leave it there. Thank you. The uh, hamlet hardly comprised uh, more than five or six dwellings belonging to those people who passed themselves off as quote unquote free blacks. 
One of the residents there was a former slave from Maryland named Jefferson Johnson, who lived in Petersburg with his wife Maria and their five children, Henry, age 12, Rachel Ann, nine, Hester Ann, seven, Alexander, four, and Susan, 16 months old. I want me to continue without the slides. Yes, please. Um, when the strangers arrived, Jefferson and his son Henry had already left the house, probably to work on a nearby farm. Likewise, Rachel Ann was also going from home to her home, as she likely worked as a domestic in a close by house. The strangers questioned the remaining three children concerning the whereabouts of their mother. Children told the man that she was working at the farm with Mr. Beck. The men climbed back into the wagons and, using the directions the children provided, traveled over to Mr. Beck's farm. The men spotted Maria milking a cow in the barnyard. They leaped from their wagons, ran to Maria, seized her, and dragged her bodily to one of the wagons. Mr. Beck stopped the men and inquired, What do you think you're doing? The men responded, this woman is our property, our slave, and we have come to reclaim her. They failed, however, to produce any proof to the inquisitor. Farmer Beck was so emotionally overwrought with what the men said that he had failed in making any attempt to stop them from carrying out their deaths as they need. The men drove off from Beck's farm at top speed to the prison, leaving Beck standing and shaking in the barnyard. The wagon returned to the Johnson house when the men gathered up and kidnapped the three Johnson children, despite the fact that nativity had all occurred in New Jersey. As one newspaper reported, quote, pitching them into the wagons like calves to market, end quote. The men then, quote, took whip to their horses and escaped to the dominions of slavery, passing by the green trees through Ellisburg, Haddonfield, etc., without stopping, end quote. If you think this was the end of Maria Johnson and her three children, he would be wrong. A young Quaker man who had grown up in the neighborhood named Thomas Haynes Dudley, age 26, had known the Johnson family most of his life. At the time of the kidnapping, Dudley had just passed the bar examination to become an attorney. He returned to his room in the Camden boarding house, despairing of his future, since he had not known of a single client. The sudden sharp rap on the door interrupted Dudley's pity party. When he opened the door, he found the august Mr. Benjamin B. Cooper standing there. Cooper, a farmer from Waterford Township, Camden County, and an known abolitionist, engaged Dudley, quote, for a case of which there were perhaps few men able or willing to undertake from its difficulty and danger, in which all the instincts of, instincts of humanity require speedy action, end quote. Cooper told Dudley that members of the Religious Society of Friends of Brunswick County held a hasty special meeting in Morristown and collectively subscribed $1,000 to redeem Maria and her children. Mr. Cooper, who had attended that meeting, told those gathered that he knew a man who had just passed the bar, whose sympathies were with the abolitionists, and above all, possessed the energy and determination necessary. Who also knew besides the captives, as the woman had often worked on his mother's farm when he was a child. Thomas Dudley accepted Cooper's case and the raise of money and prepared to head south. Donning the guard of a slave catcher, including a large, broad brimmed hat, a pair of pistols stuck in his belt, and carrying a whip, Dudley headed into enemy territory after the two wagons. Despite the rather lengthy head start, the safe pictures held, Dudley soon learned that the men had tied up in a hotel in the head of Elk Road for the night. He presented himself to them and indicated he was buying slaves to take farther south. No transaction occurred during this initial meeting with the kidnappers, but Dudley did overhear a plan by several men to rob him. The would-be robbers assumed Dudley carried a great deal of cash as a slave trader. 
So Thomas spent the entire night in the hotel's dining room, sitting in a chair backed up in a corner, with a table drawn up in front of him and laid his two pistols on the table. No one bothered to molest him during the night. Next morning, the negotiations proceeded for Maria and her youngest child, Susan. The slave catchers had already sold Kessler Ann to a woman in Colorado, and Alexander to a slave auctioneer, who maintained his cover as a slave trader, suddenly treated Maria roughly, and she failed to recognize him as an old friend. Maria considered Thomas to be the slave trader he reported to be. He ordered Maria and Susan to be locked up until he could prepare to leave. Maria, overcome with fear and emotion, reluctantly followed with Susan and Tell, and suddenly departed their dog. Initially, he headed farther south in an attempt to deceive the slave catcher, but then he turned north and traveled to Wilmington, Delaware, where the trio boarded a steamboat for Philadelphia. Once aboard the steamer, Thomas turned to Maria and said, Don't you know me? She replied, Oh, I want to. Well, they then said, don't you remember Nancy Dudley's little boy, Tom, who used to play pranks on the cow with milk for the Isha, and made him kick the pail over? Her fears instantly melted, and her face reflected the joy of seeing a friend behind the eyes of a slave trader. Though they told her that she and Susan were headed home, and the happiness she felt could not be contained. Of the other two children sold in World War, a sale advertised for Alexander appeared in the newspaper. And Thomas Dudley succeeded in buying him back for ninety dollars before the auction occurred. Despite attempts to also purchase Hester Hester Ann from the woman who acquired her, she initially remained separated from the family. Mention of Dudley's hearing deeds appeared in William Lloyd Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator. Quote, the West Jersey abducted slaves. Several vet vet benevolent gentlemen of West Jersey. Regarding the late abduction of the wife of Jefferson Johnson with her three children, all born in New Jersey, as an outrage upon humanity and law, interested themselves to discover the perpetrators and rescue the victims. We learned from the Camden Mail that they had succeeded in recovering one of the children, and it is added, quote, We are not at liberty to go into particulars. It may say that one child, a boy of 10 years old, has been brought back with money advanced by an individual. And that effort, and that efforts are, make, are making, which will lead to the recovery of the poor woman and the other children. Ninety dollars was paid for the boy, and a considerable additional sum will be needed to redeem the mother and other children. An appeal was made to the benevolent in their behalf. In February 1847, two years after the kidnapping, editions of the Camden Mail, uh, an article appeared concerning Hester Ann, which he's reported in part. Quote, the old lady who bought her at Baltimore when the stolen family was conveyed had recently deceased. After providing for the manumission of the children, child and her will, the very original promise made at the time of her purchase. This completes the restoration of the whole family. End quote. After Jefferson and Maria Johnson reunited, the couple added two more children to the family, Jefferson Jr. and Dua. The family continued to live in Petersburg, Mount Laurel, who had reached 1876. And, uh, you know, I think I'll stop there since we don't have the slides. We won't do the other one, and then we'll let uh, Stan do the history. Thank you. Thank you. Samuel C. Steele III is the third great grandson of Levin and Jerry Steele. His third great grandparents were the parents of William Steele, who was proclaimed by the New York Times in their 1902 obituary of William Steele, the father of the Underground Railroad. Samuel began telling his family's story at 13 years old, local elementary school in southern New Jersey, where he grew up. As a child, his father, Samuel Steele Jr., would take him along long hikes in and around the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, where Levin and Charity raised their 18 children. They would visit the old family homestead in Shamal Township and other places that were part of the family history. 
They would attend the numerous family reunions that were held every year in different towns in New Jersey, always taking notes on the stories from other family members. As an adult, Samuel Steele has given presentations about his family's history at local schools, at universities, and numerous celebrations of Black history. He has done significant research on the Reverend and Charity Steele uh, project, project. He has spent countless hours tracing his family's ancestry to slavery and to present day. In 2005, he worked with other family members to get from the environmental path and print and was given the prestigious honor of writing the Steele family purpose in that edition. Recently, he was also given the honor to write the forward in the 2015 edition of Early Recollections of the Life of Dr. James Steele. He has visited with Charles Watson at Temple University, Tara Duxworth at Keene University, and Dr. Clara Small at Salisbury State University. He is currently the founder and chairman of the Dr. James Steele Historic Office Site Association. The association is New Jersey State Park's official friends group that assists in managing a 21-acre state park named after Dr. James Steele. Samuel holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Architectural Engineering from North Carolina A&T State University. He is a former U.S. Coast Guard Commission Officer, a construction manager, a historian, a motorcycle enthusiast, and a semi-professional photographer. Uh, he is a very passionate, he is very passionate about telling his family story, history, and learning more about the importance of the American history. So please help me welcome Samuel Silver. Thank you. I too you can have a uh, PowerPoint, but I can work with that. I mean, I get all the points I like to talk about. But, but oh, I like Sammy on the podium. He drives me crazy. Makes me feel like I can't connect with the people. All right, once again, my name is Sammy Taylor for the story. I'm from Morristown, New Jersey. Um, I've been telling my family stories since uh, 13 years old. I'm all right. Thanks for all the school. My mother talked me into it. <laughs> Didn't really want to do it, but I did it anyway. Um, the family started, the, the part of the issue that, that I used to give an overview of why, I give an overview basically of why slavery, how slavery got started, and why it lasted. Because some people get it confused. Slavery lasted in this country because it was free labor. When the colonists came over here, they needed labor force in order to develop the nation. And once tea and coffee and the consumption of those materials and sugar became an increased a regular commodity in, in the English colony, in order to produce sugar, they produced it from sugar cane. They needed a labor force to do that. The labor force, unfortunately, was enslaved Africans from Africa. And it lasted as long as it did because of it, because it was free labor. It was the economy. They needed it to keep it moving. So I talk about this so we understand why it lasted. It lasted because it was, it was, it was economic. So as you say, my third great grandparents, Levin and Cherry Still, actually, Levin and Sidney Still, were both slaves. Levin was able to buy his freedom. His, he was willed to a young master who they were around the same age. And around and November 22nd, 1700, Levin Steel, S T E E L, was able to buy his freedom. Now, his wife, Sidney Still, or Steel at the time, was still on the plantation in Caroline County. Maryland. So around 1804, 1805, they decided to make a break and leave Maryland and come to, and come to the free state. They had help from other Quakers in the area, in that area of uh, Delaware and Maryland. My grandmother, I, I call my grandmother, but I'm saying my third grandmother. She comes across with four children. She had two girls and two boys on the first escape. She was caught. In a place called Greenwich, New Jersey, which is very south, south New Jersey. Um, you would know near Brixton, if you know the area, Brixton itself. She was caught, she was taken back in, in the bondage, and her owner, uh, 
Sandra Griffin, Alexander Griffin, decided to keep her locked up in the garret, thinking that if she be kept her there for a period of time, she would finally realize that she couldn't be free. Well, it didn't work. But unfortunately, what she had to do on her second attempt, she had to leave the two boys in slavery. She figured that the boys had a better chance of surviving slavery than the two girls. Because we know what happened to women. They were enslaved African for property. You did what you wanted to do with your property. You wanted to fuck. So Charity real Sydney realized that she couldn't take all four. So she left the boys in slavery. And their names were Peter and Levin. So remember those names. I'll come back to that. So they come back over to New Jersey. She reunites with her husband Levin. And in order to in order to hide the fact that she was a fugitive, she changed and changed her last name from Steel S T E S T E E L to S T I L L to what we call present day Steel. They were allowed to hide the hide within the name of the Steel family who were already living in South Jersey. A very specific point, especially for people who are trying to trace their, their genealogy in the area. So they come, they come into New Jersey. In order to, in order even more to change the fact, they change their last name. She changed her first name from Sydney to Charity. So now it's Charity, it's Lemon and Charity still. And even more so, they decide to move into the Pine Bar. I don't know if you guys have been to, you met ladies and men have been to Pine Bar, but it's a pretty desolate place even to death. So I can imagine what it looked like in 1805, 1806. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do real quick. So when, people, when, I, when someone has the floor, you have to speak. <laughs> when, when you're speaking and someone starts talking, you just be quiet. You don't know they hear it. And that's what this is so to go back to my story. So now they move to the pine grounds. And they begin to raise a family. My second great grandfather, Samuel Still, was the first freeborn male in that family. He was born uh 1807 of the year. 1807 <laughs> So, out of that family of 18 children, and we realized that there was only 14 of them that made it to a father. We believe four of them were born stillborn. So the list of the catalog of children that we had that was given to us, that were presented in 1850, only named 14 children. But out of those 14 children, three of them became historical noteworthy people. And that was William Still, Dr. James Still, and the brother that I said, Peter. Okay? Now, William still was a baby of the bunch. He was uh, born in 1821. He decided when he became of age, he moved over to Philadelphia in 1844. Now, William still goes to Philadelphia in 1844. He gets a job working as a, as a, I don't want to say a house servant, but he gets a job working for a Quaker lady that allows him to read and learn how to read and work. She encourages him to improve himself. So around 1847, he answers an ad at the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Office at 5th and Arch Street in Philadelphia. Now he becomes a mailroom clerk and a janitor. But he, but he did so well at it, he got so involved in the operations of freeing and helping fugitive slaves out of bondage over the years. By 1849, 1850, now he's the chairman of the anti slavery office. And what that office did was to provide tickets, food, medicine, uh, protection, and a network for, ins for enslaved Africans running away and trying to get the food. He helped, set he helped set up settlements in Canada for, for fugitive blacks. Um, he was he's given it the, the, the account of over helping over 800 to 1600 and few, uh, few slaves coming through. 
Um, he was very adamant about helping his people. He was very, very adamant in, in, um, about doing what was the right thing for the community and the black community. He worked with people like Harriet Tubman. Have you seen the movie Harriet? When they say William Still, that was my second grade off. That's how involved he was in the underground area of the He was the main station master, if you want to say, out of the Philadelphia, out of the Eastern Line. So Harriet Tubman did 21 trips down, down to Dorchester County. And she only really, she only really freed the 70 or so people that was her family in Dorchester. But what they teach you in school is that she ran down down south, also all over the south, and she was freeing thousands and thousands of people. She wasn't. She was going back and forth from Philadelphia, Cape May, New Jersey, down to Dorchester, freeing her family. Where they come up with this general topic was that she became a scout and a nurse in the Civil War and ended up helping free uh, like 700 to 800 slaves on those plantations out of the, uh, I want to say the Kahambi River. That's how she got that name of being a general topic. And how she, how the history books kind of screwed that she was running around off in the south free. She really traveled back and forth. To Dorchester, but she did that with the help of William Still. Without his help, she may not be able to do some of the things that she did. So William Still was, was helping her. He was friends with Frederick Douglass, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Reverend May, and all those individuals that were part of the underground railroad network. Sending people all into Canada, all different places. I talk about some interesting, he wrote um, in 1872 after the Civil War ended, he was given permission to write the book on the Railroad. The Underground Railroad was the only book of its time during that time. He was charged, when people came through to his office, he immediately sat down with them and started writing the stories. Just like they showed in a movie, that's what he did in real life. And that book was produced in 1872, and it was the only book that was produced at that time. So those stories were as factual and real time as they were. There were other books that were written later on. Even so, um, there, was a, there, was a, there was a professor out of Ohio State that wrote a book in the, uh, the early 1900s. And he was writing back and forth to Frederick Douglass about, the underground, about his work on the underground. And he said, I wrote it. I said, I wrote to William Still. No, he said, I wrote, I'm writing to Freddie Douglas. I noticed that you're not in William Still's book, The Underground Railroad. I really mentioned, you would think with a volume of information that William Still provided in the Underground Railroad, you would think that Frederick Douglas would be in that book. The problem happened, what occurred was that Frederick Douglas criticized William Still for writing The Underground Railroad. Because he said to William, those people that travel through your office or on the Underground Railroad should write their own story. The women like, they can't even read and write. How do you, how, how do you expect them to write their story? So with that, so when William still wrote his book, there's like about a, three sentences with Frederick Douglass in the whole entire 800 page book. That's how adamant or how stern William Still was about what he believed in. So he did, you know, so he did all this work on the railroad. And then after the, when the Civil War came around, he was so well known in the city of Philadelphia that when they formed the Camp William Penn that trained the black soldiers to go, to, to go into the Civil War, he was given, he was given a job as post sergeant Paul Sutler is the person that is the contract officer of a camp, a military camp. So he was in charge of buying the shoes, the guns, the ammo, the food, building the tents. That was all part of his job to hire those people to provide those services. And he wasn't, he didn't even, he even bid for the job. The Secretary of the Army wrote him personally and said, We still, I want you to be the post Sutler. Because of your esteem and your, your business savvy, 
and, and, and you're, you're committed to your people in the city of Philadelphia, we want you to be this person. He did the job very well, as you know. And he also was part of, he helped desegregate the Charlie Cars in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, this time, when we say Charlie Cars, what they were, they were, they were basically um, Charlie Cars, but they were on rails, but they were drawn by horses, they were pulled by horses. Williamson, the circle was a Williamson was up in Germantown, Philadelphia. It was a cold, snowy night. We all know what we've been going through a period of living. Right? Can you imagine? You're in Germantown. You live, you live at Fifth and, say, like Fifth and Locust, right? You're in Germantown, a cold, wintry, snowy night. Already, blacks are not supposed to sit inside the car. Well, he went down inside the car and the conductor said, oh, no, you can't sit here. Get back on the outside and hold on. And we still figured it was safer for him to walk on five miles than to ride on the side of the trolley car. So what he did, he started a boycott against the trolley car system in Philadelphia. It took him about six to seven years and almost bankrupt the bankrupt all trolley cars in the city. So he was one of the first civil rights activists in the city of Philadelphia. Way before Octavius Cato came along. They knew of each other, but by the time Octavius Cato came along, he was, Williamson was much older, and Octavius Cato was younger. In a sense, Octavius Cato was like a, I would think like the Black Lives Matter, you know, the, the militant, that comparison. Where Williamson was like, you know, there's ways of doing things, that's not the way of doing it. But if they would have been able to get together and be on the same page, well, that's going to be no change. Williamson started, he got the first black police officer in the city of Philadelphia. He created the first black bank in Philadelphia. He created, he um, was a founder of the, um, the black, all black YMCA on Christian Street. All these things he was part of. He was so, even after the Civil War ended, in 1874, uh, there was a, there was a America, America um, election going on. William Still outwardly publicly said, I'm voting for the Democratic man. And, 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 his, and his, the, 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 the people were like, What do you mean? You can't vote for the Democrat. Because remember, those times, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, so most all blacks voted Republican. So it was so much, it was so much that they came to him and said, What's, Why are you picking this guy? Why are you endorsing him? And he said, You know what? Set up the town hall meeting. I'll give an address why I'm doing it. In summary, we have said, we have still said to folks, you need to take the time to learn about who you're voting for. Just don't vote for the party because everybody's doing it. Take the time and understand who you are voting for. Just don't vote for a long party line. Take that time. And I just think that message is so apropos to that, right? So he was that and so he was that type of person. He also gave another address about how he desegregated the trolley car. So in 1902 when he passed away, he was given the title of the father of our rare. Um what else about William so he was a, a very well known coal and merchant um, supplier in the city. He lived he his office was his home yard was 1216, 1218, 1220 South Washington Avenue. There's a picture of his business at the his archives. He's standing in front of it. He was a black man that had not just a, like a storefront, he had a whole block for his business. Um, his daughter, Caroline, because of her uncle, Dr. James Still, and Dr. James Still's son, who was a third African American man that graduated from Harvard Medical School, she was influenced by them and encouraged by them to become the first female African American woman to be licensed assistant in the city of Florida. So his impact on a lot of different people in Philadelphia was, was wide and vast. He created an orphanage 
for black children whose parents or fathers have died in the Civil War. So that's the, that's the depth of Williams' story. That's just a, a tip of the iceberg of some of the things he's done in the area. And he was very close to, to his brother, Dr. James Sir. And we don't have any evidence of Dr. James Sir was part of the railroad, but we do know that Dr. James Sir and Williams in 1855 went out to St. Catharines, Canada to, over, to look at a settlement that Williams Sir was sending people to. My historian friend would, 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 would may have a slight debate, but I have the feeling that. Dr. Still, somewhere along the line, was helping his brother out. It just wasn't written. But I just think because they were so close that somewhere along the line, they were helping each other out. The other part of the story that's significant is this. I mentioned a guy named Peter, right? Brother named Peter. Well, we'll back up a minute. And Peter was about seven or eight when his mother left him in the first and what was customary then was that because you was in the border state, and I say border state, you you replace the, the, the state that you would make the books now. Those plantation owners would immediately sell off your family members because they were afraid that the ones that became free would come back. So he sold Peter and Levin off to a place called Kentucky, the state of Kentucky. And they ended up being in uh, Levin ended up dying. Levin had a hard time in slavery. He was, he was beaten a few times and he really suffered after some of his beatings and he died from long term injuries of those things. But Peter survived. Peter ended up being a muscle sold out of Bama. And what I tell about Peter is this Peter ended up being a skilled person. He learned how to mend shoes. He learned how to tell. He learned a bunch of different trades. And realized back then down south, we were the skilled labor. We just always, we just always was in token cotton and picking cotton. We were your carpenters. We were your blacksmiths. We were skilled people. We learned trades. We worked with our hands. We learned things. We knew those things. Much more than what you learn in history in the history book. Everybody was picking cotton, shuffling and shuffling, no sir, no man, all that kind of stuff, right? So Peter learned these things. And he became so good at them that his owner started farming them out to different people that needed his services. But Peter paid attention to the people that he was working for. And he could listen to how they were talking about them. So Peter became, Peter ended up working for two Jewish merchants. They ended up in Alabama, muscle sold out of Alabama. They set up shop there. And Peter realizes that these guys weren't really cool about slavery. But I always say, when in Rome, you go to Rome with them. Right or wrong, right? But they weren't cool about it. And Peter started picking up on the language about it. You know, they really care for it. You know, they, they, were, they were part of those Jews that got kicked out of Germany in those 1800s, the period of 1800. They were really were kicked out of so many places. It's it, 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 it amazing to be an understandable history on that. But what he was able to do was that he would take clothes and stuff and he would mend with them. He'd take it down to, back to the plantation and he would exchange up for, for produce. He would take the produce back to the town, to the city, and he was able to sell it. And he was able to do this on the weekends to make a little bit of money. So he talks to two Jewish merchants into buying it. And he says to them, if you, if you buy me, I'll pay you back when you set me free. And they were like, yeah, we'll do that Peter for you. And again, Peter was skeptical because a lot of people said things and they didn't own up to, their, to what they said. So Peter, he gets him to, 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 to um, purchase him. And Peter goes, the night that they buy him from his owner, he goes into their office that night and he puts $300 down on the desk and says, here's $300 down on $500 I owe you. 
He was like, whoa, are you serious? They didn't know he had been saving his money. So within a year or so, he saved the money up. But they couldn't free him in Alabama because it was against the law. It was against the law. So, okay, what do you mean now? Right? Well, like I said, they didn't care for slavery. So they actually, they actually closed up and moved up to Ohio and freed Peter. Now, Peter took one of the last and freed it because that was the last set of owners that had owned it. He didn't know what his, his parents were saying. Right? So we traveled some 1,600 miles into Philadelphia, and someone says, man, you need to go see a guy named William Still, the Pennsylvania Infrastructure Market. He goes in the office and starts telling the story of William. He says, you know, I'm looking for my family. And my mother's name was Sidney. My father's name was Levin. And I had a brother named Levin who died. And so William was looking at me. Whoa, where is he? Hold on. This is the same. This is the same. You look like part of my family, first of all. And then you, you're naming names that nobody would know my mother's name. Nobody. The family never talked about the fact that her name was really Sydney. They kept it very close knit. Levin actually was very protective of his wife when he lived down in Pondway. Very protective of her. So the family never talked about it. So we was like, well, wait a minute, you're my brother. It took William about two to three days to convince Peter because he had to take Peter to his sister who was living in Philadelphia. The Earl, my older sister that had left with the mother, and that's when they reunited. Now, that's not even the end of the story. Now Peter's free. And a lot of times, people were like, okay, I'm free. Yeah, I got family. But I don't know how I'm going to get my family. I have no clue. So a lot of people's families are completely lost. Not Peter. Peter, story. Exploded in the newspapers and all the black newspapers. It was well known that he was this poor uh, slave that found his brother, reunited his family. And the word got out that he wanted to get his family free. There was a white gentleman named Seth Compton, who was an Irishman, who just decided that he wasn't a, he wasn't a civil rights activist, he wasn't an abolitionist. I was sitting some kind of like adventure. He decides to help William and Peter get his family back. Now, Peter travels back to Alabama and pretends he's still a slave. He goes back to the plantation where his wife's at and he gives her a piece of cloth. And he says, When you get this back, give me a piece of your cloth, give me a piece of your bread. And when you get this back, you know it's somebody that I sent to free you. And the crazy thing is that he goes back to Muscle Shoals, Alabama, back from town. And some of the, some of the people here were like, are you still working for the Jewish merchants? Peter, oh, we'll buy you back. You don't want to work for those guys. Like, that's crazy. Come back to Muscle Shoals, and I'll buy you and work for me for the rest of your life. And Peter's like, nah, I'm good. Like, I'm good. Let me just do what I got to do. I'm getting back at it. So he goes back to Philadelphia. And, and there's this whole exchange of letters of what's going on. And Seth Conklin goes down to Alabama, is able to get to his friend, wife, Levina, and he brings them up into Ohio. They get along the Columbia River. They get caught. They beat this Seth Conklin. They tie his hands up, they kick him off in the river to drown. And they send uh, Peter's wife and two children back down to the owner in Alabama. So now Peter, what are you going to do? All right? What do you do? So then there's this whole exchange of how the owner travels and goes out there, pretends that you know he's not a, he's not a uh, he's not the owner. He actually goes in and meets William Still. He, he changes his name, all right? And he has his exchange with William Still. So he, goes, so he leaves Philadelphia, he goes back to Alabama, and he writes his letter to William Still. Peter, 
I'm better off seeing you go. He's a very well to do man, well polished and educated, entrepreneur. I think you can have five thousand dollars before you family. So he he plugged the ransom on Peter's family of five thousand dollars in eighteen fifty. Now, I don't know what's up, but even today, five thousand dollars could be a tough, could be a tough look to get when you're uneducated, you don't have a job, brother, brother can read or write. How in the world was Peter going to go for five thousand dollars? Peter didn't stop. William still helped him introduce him to all the big heavyweights in the abolition movement. He traveled off to the Northeast. He met Harry Beecher Stowe. He met William Wood Garrison. If you have, if you have any information you want to read about on abolition, read up on William Wood Garrison. He was one guy that was fired up about ending slavery. He put his life on the line. So when we talk about when I talk about the ending of the railroad and slavery, I don't say that all whites were bad. But there was white people that was fighting that was sincere about ending slavery. And William Lloyd Garrison was one of his men. So he meets all these people and he's able to go speak and he talks about how bad slavery was. And he's given donations for that. Speaking for it, right? So within five years, he raises a five thousand dollars to buy his land, and he ends up settling in Burlington Township, what we would call Burlington Township. And he owns, he operates a produce business where he grows produce, takes it in the city of Burlington, and sells it. So that's William and Peter's story, and, it, and, and Peter's story is the movie. I have his book. His book is called The Kidnapped and the Ransom. Um. Phenomenal book. It's just an amazing story. When you read it, it's like reading a movie. It's like you, you can picture the scenes. It's just amazing. And it's twists and it's turns. There's all kinds of stuff going on. So I just gave you the, 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 just a tidbit of the story. So I would say everybody else has a favorite uncle for a right? Mine was Dr. Sid. Dr. Sill was born in 1812, April 9th, 1812, and he died in 1882. He lived in Metro, he ended up living in Metro, New Jersey, but as a little boy, the doctor came to fascinate the children. And from that image of that doctor coming to see his family and fascinating the children, he wanted to become a doctor. So I say to people, you never know the imprint you put on your children at an early age to determine what they do. And they become out of it. And here's a man with no education, barely any education. He had three months of formal education. And that was somewhere between the ages of like 15 and 17 or 18. And it was at the end of every harvest. He had a month, month of education. And he got teased so bad, I think his father found his father found four out of school. Mother having in school being teased and being, being subjected to that, to that. But Dr. Dr. James only had in his mind he was going to become a doctor. He didn't know how he was going to do it. So as he gets old enough to go to Philadelphia, gets a job in a, in a glue making factory. Now, glue back then was made out of Muscles and tendons from cows and horses in the butcher shops. It was a smelly, nasty job. I guess he didn't sell that because nobody wants to do it. <laughs> so he goes and he, and, and he goes, he saves his money, and he's able to go buy some books from botany, physiology, and some herbal medicine. You know, so back then, herbal medicine was a, was a normal thing. Herbal medicine didn't become like a negative thing until medicine, until scientists started um, synthesizing morphine and drugs. And then when those things became more prevalent, people looked at herbal medicine as kind of like 
witchcraft or, or something crazy. But it really wasn't. So doctors still learn how to distill from the local plants from sassafras, from Virginia snake leaf one of plants, from skunk cattle. He learned how to distill these medicines from these from the natural plants. And he comes back over to Method in Jersey, over off the church, church road in Method, and he starts to sell his medicine. He becomes so well known throughout the county that people start calling him the black doctor of Palm. He didn't just serve just blacks, he served white and black. People came from all around to come and see Dr. Sill. People who had, who had been working with other doctors and were not getting better. Finally, someone would say to them, You need to go see that black guy in the park. <laughs> and there was reluctance. There was there was like, oh, I'm not going to see him. Ah, you know, that kind of thing. And there were some people who said, you know what? Once a month, I'm throwing my hand up. This isn't working. He would go see Dr. Phil and make him weeks, a month, or whatever it was. So it was. It was known that he had a cure for skin cancer. Uh, he had a cure for a type of tuberculosis. It was a tuberculosis that really hit a lot of children about that day. And it was a, like a lesion on your skin. You could heal people from it. And he got so well known that the white doctors in the area hated him because he was making money. So when you start making money, you start impacting people's businesses, they come at you. The devil comes at you, right? But he was smart enough and he was well known enough that, and I just found this out a couple years ago. In his book, he talks, he talks about going to see a lawyer named. Don Tennant, right? Don Tennant. Don Tennant, now I've read the story a thousand times, a couple hundred times, whatever, right? Some came in one day, who was Don Tennant in my home with Lord? I looked him up, and he was a retired Supreme Court Justice. Dr. James was so well enough, so well, so well known enough that he could go to a lawyer of that county and ask him for assistance. And can I tell him, just don't call yourself a doctor, don't give a prescription. You can sell it like you like you sell over the counter medicine. That's how you get around that, around that, that, that problem. So the white doctor was running around saying that he was going to give prescriptions and, and you know prescribing stuff to people. So he got around it and he really he just flourished on it. By the time he was 50 years old, he had paid off all his debt. And then he started buying and flipping houses, what we would call buying and flipping houses today. So by the time that he, by the time he died, he, had a, he was probably the wealthiest man in the county in Grand County. He owned $50,000 in property. He had plenty of houses, different places he was buying. And what I, what I take from the story is not so much all, all about the early medicine. What do you spell in my people? They are the drinking houses, all right? Down the bar. Buy property, save your money, and respect one another. Respect one another. And that was the way of success. The same things we tell young people today that he said in 1877, that we still try to get into people's heads. You know, buy from property. All right, drink, don't let consume whatever you do to them. You know, manage it. Be respectful to each other. See, a lot of people like to tell the story that Dr. James still pulled himself up by the boots. And I like to argue that point because when you read his book, he understands that he got help from people, from his associations of his friends, and not just blacks, from whites. The Quakers that he was able to borrow money from. He paid them back. And when he paid them back, they were like, oh, wait a minute. Dr. Silk, you paid everything, everything back. You could have good with me. Anytime you need some money. Dr. Silk, there was a, a tavern around the corner from his house. And the gentleman that owned it told him point blank, Nick and Jimmy would never own this piece of property. The 
the property went up for sale, it was an auction off. So I still went around for the bid off. He didn't think he was going to win. Went around for the bid off. Well, he goes back home, goes back later on the day, and he was like, Dr. Snell, Dan, Dan, you got, you just, you won the bid. You won. Because the person that won the bid originally couldn't come up with the full mortgage. The doctor still, all right, I got, I got credit, I got, I'll pay it back. So he ended up with this calendar that he turned into a hospital and a tenement home to help treat people. Both of both him and women were very industrious men. They were frugal, they saved their money. James Dr. Still writes in his book that, if it, and I can't quote it because it's verbatim, but basically what he says, you know, some people call him stingy because he saved his money. But he thought that if he didn't save his money, he wouldn't have any money to help anybody else when he needed it. That's what he was thinking. Like he, he wanted his money, you know? He wanted his book big like this. And, and he built. He built his home, he built his, he built his home and office, starting in 1855, and pretty much had to finish everything for it. 1869, he had a three story Victorian style home that sat on the church road in Memphis. He had an office next to it. He had all the modern day amenities, such as he had cisterns, underground water tanks, that the water run off from the house would go in these tanks. So his wife didn't have to go, and the kids didn't have to go outside and use the bathroom. They pumped water from these cisterns. They had one in the kitchen, and they had one underneath the front floor. So he had to go outside his bed. He had to go outside his water when it was cold. So his home, and there's a picture of it in his book. And his book is called Dr. James, The Life and Times of Dr. Early Recollection of Dr. James Sid. Um, he was just a phenomenal person. He was in competition with his brother, I said, because his brother wrote a book in 1872 and Dr. Silver wrote a book in 1882. You know, so there was slightly competition between each other. But he had uh, eight or nine children, and one of his sons became the third uh, man to graduate, African American man to graduate from Harvard Medical School. He was a one man doctor in the city of Boston. And just, you know, just a phenomenal person. Now, I will say this, though. Dr. Still had a son that became an herbalist like him. He lived in Mount Holly. And what I say is that the story is that his son Joseph became an herbalist. But his son Joseph didn't take didn't listen to all the lessons that his father was teaching him, evidently, because as he became his doctor in Mount Holly, he brought this carriage, the white carriage, he had white horses, and he, he pranced around Mount Holly like he was a he was the man. And he upset the political power in the city of the town of Mount Holly. And the political power blacklisted him, shut him down. He became a drunk. He got divorced. And he died of pulpit, in a pulpit way. And I say that, I say that part of the story because I always tell people, it doesn't matter how much you pour into your child. Your child still has to take some ownership for themselves. They still have to. They still have to listen. <laughs> the, lesson, the lesson that you teach them. Because when you read Dr. Steele's book, you, you would think that every single one of his ch children would be this phenomenal person. And when you hear the story about his son Joseph, it's just a total like. You know, it wasn't frugal. I know it doesn't seem like he had a lot of humil humility about himself. Um, it was very interesting. All. So that's the major stories on the family. And you know, I'll just kind of briefly talk about my journey on some of this. So the people, the people have been asking me, how did you go about doing this? I had some help from my historian friend, Paul Shaw. Um, 
it started, I started doing some research years ago and I started posting stuff on the family page. And I was saying to people, well, I don't know if we're all blood related. And man, it did upset people. What do you mean? I'm a cell. What blood related? My family all tied back to the beginning prince of 11 chapter still. And I was always like, the stories don't even match. The beginning prince came off of, off a slave ship, but 11 came out of Maryland, brought his freedom. So how are they the two same people? It don't even make sense. So I started posting as I was doing research and I was checking names on the on, 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 on ancestry.com, I'm going to the archives, looking at stuff, come to find out that not all is still the bug later. Because again, the story is, he changed the last name. But I say to the South Jersey facility in the area, if it wasn't for your family, my family would not have survived. No, the whole story could have been totally different. Charity, the city may not have been able to change the name. Leather may not have been able to change the last name. She might have been caught and recaptured in all kinds of stuff. Because we were just talking about it in the car before we came, before we came in. I posted a couple of days ago about a white lady in Delaware. Her name was Patty Cannon. And this Patty Cannon in the article said she was the first female serial killer in America. When I saw it, I was like, what? And I heard about the story. She was this woman that had a slave catching crew. You had a gang of people that would come across in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and capture people. She was known to kill babies and all kinds of crazy stuff. And this is all in the same time that Lemon and Cherry still was escaping. So I understand why maybe not even more understand the fact that why they protected the name. So I did all this research. I went down to Paul and I happened to go down to uh, State Archive and I found letters and ammunition papers. They were found in the land deed book. Because understand that enslaved Africans are property. So they weren't these freedom books. Until about 1810. He was many minutes, November 22nd, 1798. So I did a lot of research. I checked Ancestry.com with the archives. I checked wills, probate records. You have to really do it. Ancestry.com, I say, is, a, is an outline. It starts you going. But when you start running into the Roblox, you start, to start checking slave owners' wills, because a lot of times they will. Were slaves to their family members. So if you know if there was a name like your whatever great your grandfather's name was John or Jim or whatever. A lot of times, if he was will through other people's state was will and will, he'd be like, oh, I'll give my boy Nick girl, my nigga boy Jim to my son, such and such. And that's how that's how I started doing this research. So I say to people that our ancestors left bloodstains or breadcrumbs. All we have to do is take the time to find out and to do the research. And I, can, I can't tell you the feeling I felt when I read my great great grandfather's freedom. So when people come to me and talk that crap, oh, you need to go back to Africa, I look at them like, you know what, my people married some early before the revolutionary war. You need to even get out of my face with that stuff. There's a pride that I have that I say to people, my family helped develop this country more so than your family, because your family might have came over here in 1910. So don't come at me looking down at me with this, this privilege that you think you have. But I'm looking at this young and working this hard off of free labor. So there's a part of it. So it makes me look at things a little differently sometimes when people come at me. And I sometimes I brush it off and sometimes I call them my phone. So our ancestors left the blood stains and work on That's the fact. I just now did. Um, my African ancestors are calling and waiting for the belt to come back. Because I've realized now that a male's Y chromosome is passed from father to son. Doesn't change. I'm a direct lineage to Levin Still. My Y chromosome is the same Y chromosome that Levin Still has. And I'm hoping that this, hoping that this test kind of gives me a more pinpointed area in West Africa. 
Also, my sales pitch. In 2006, the family got together and got the state of New Jersey to buy Dr. Still's property. Right now, I manage a site of 21 acres, the state park I have in New Jersey, all volunteers. We just in the past year or so finally formed our own father on secret, our own father on secret, working, working, running. The COVID, COVID has kind of put a little damp on some things, but we switched gears. We started doing virtual. I, I was here this morning. We just gave a, a virtual uh, presentation on archaeological data that we've had at the Dr. Last week, we gave a presentation on how to make an elderly syrup in the new producing immune system. We are now focusing on our directions going to try to create a center for holistic and wellness so that African American people can come and feel um, okay to come and learn about maybe being a vegetarian. I'm not a vegetarian. I've tried it for six months. I get it. I just haven't been able to hold on to it. But I get it. We need to learn how to be more healthy in our lives. We have a one, a one mile nature walk. Um, the 20, we just got another three acres and we're getting ready to move into this year. A, uh, what, was, what was a, uh, a vegan restaurant? It's a soil island, right? That, that closed and we, we got the state to purchase it for us. So this year we're going to move into a place that's, that's, that's a small residence that has got a commercial kitchen. And we're going to leave a set of exhibits and we're hoping to bring the school kids back into the area. Back in, we, we usually get kids, we can focus on just the kids in Medford and some of the Brown County, some of the charter school. But we brought, we brought kids in to teach about Dr. Sale. We had herbal garden, garden. We had them go pick the, pick the herbs, let them smell it, tell them about what these herbs do and what you see from the different season. We're going to expand that. Um, we have some old barns. We're going to build some gazebos and some other different things. So we're really excited about this time coming up. Uh, the restoration of Dr. Silva's office has started. Um, the state has finally said, okay, we're going to fully commit to fund the complete restoration of the Dr. James Silva office. It's something we've been fighting for since 2006. And it's finally coming to fruition. And that's because the, my organization, is actively stayed in front of New Jersey saying, hey, we're here. You're not going to overlook us anymore. You're not going to let this site fall down around itself because the people here, white and black, that love the story of Dr. James still in Silk County. And because of our influence, it is called Dr. Kirk. So I passed off some flyers and brochures. Um, I have business cards with the email address. We started a YouTube channel. We're on Instagram. We're doing a big social media push. And we're hoping that when we get to open up, that we'll be able to have people come. I'd love to have the drum the, the, the ensemble come. That's perfect. We, have, we, have a, uh, we already have a stage. You know, we, we're thinking about doing farmer markets and, and all kinds of different things. So be on the lookout. Log into the site, uh, go to the website, hit up on your IG, and, and keep, keep checking on us. It's growing. We need volunteers. We need volunteers to come. You know, the site, people just come out and just walk the trail. Right now, we're not open for exhibits that we have in the education center. But people come and just walk the trails, and they love it. And I'm the one up there cutting the grass, so you see the grass is the time. Okay. What's the The website is Dr. James Steele Center. The Instagram page is Dr. James Still. So we're growing. We're looking to get some, some new fresh blood. I got a young people who have uh, TikTok videos. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's one more thing with social media that I'm just not good at yet. I got all of the TikTok videos. But yeah, so I thank you for your time. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you. I have the Dr. James Snow book.
I have a Pete Peterson book, and I have another book that uh, it's a it's an interview of William Still and some of the one of our some of the one of our members here. And those three books that I have today are all because of that man right here. Well, well, I have another um, the Doctor's Day book ten dollars, the Peterson book is ten, and the Peterson book is six. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Steele. Well, we are grateful for a successful first annual Black History Observance Ceremony. Uh, we are so grateful to the African Drumming Dance Ensemble. Please give a round of applause. <laughs> so grateful to the beginning of the orators, uh, two students, uh, did a great job with their pieces. So <laughs> grateful to Mr. Wick, Mr. Paul, uh, Shop, and uh, Mr. Sam Seal. It is so important to understand the foundation of our history in order to maintain the trajectory uh, and, and uh, live on and respect and honor the legacy that is put before us. Uh, it's one of the key things I, I keyed in on when uh, Mr. Steele was talking was the same things that Dr. James Seal was preaching back then on the same thing that are applicable today, right? Uh, and so, and another thing he talked about was what would have happened if his great uncle William Seal would have teamed up with the other abolitionists, right? And it's very important for us to understand that coming together is, is truly the most important and foundational thing that we need uh, during this time where we, we need to come together uh, after so much division and divisiveness, uh, it is great to be able to be in this space so where we can come together. So thank you for coming out. Uh, if you enjoyed yourself, uh, please, uh, please uh, take a look at the program. We have a QR code for our crowdfunding uh, campaign. Uh, if you're watching online, uh, there's a link to our crowdfunding campaign as well. So we continue to do things like this for the community. Uh, we have the wonderful Kismet who's going to end the ceremony with amazing grace. We have refreshments in the back. Feel free to help yourself. And thank you so much once again.